So we're on the uh, the glorious topic of uh, conservative Judaism. Today. That's the uh, the next step in the uh, the development of this uh, this reformish uh, movement. Conservatism is very interesting in the sense that uh, it's not quite as bizarre as uh, as reform, and it does borrow quite a bit from orthodoxy. So here we're already coming closer to something that um, that somewhat resembles orthodox Judaism. 1885, we had this famous Pittsburgh platform where the, uh, the reform movement uh, came out with a bunch of bombastic announcements about uh, trying to unify the movement and, uh, and come to some kind of consensus on what they believe and what they do, etc. So the, uh, the, the conservative uh, movement, the conservative movement um, started its roots basically right around that, where they said, look, some of these ideas are just too far out there. They're just too gone for us to, uh, to subscribe to. And it took the, the, uh, the conservative movement almost a hundred years to actually state what it was that they did believe in. I think this is fascinating. Of all the things that you can uh, analyze and come to certain conclusions from, the very fact that from 1885 until about 1973, the conservatives never actually published some kind of a platform, you know, what it is that they believe in, what they reject, where they have similarities and differences. They just kind of coasted along with, well, we're not Reform and we're not Orthodox. But they were much closer to Orthodox than they were to Reform. It's been said, by the way, that in the late 19th century and the early 20th century, you would have trouble distinguishing between an Orthodox and a Conservative rabbi. It has been said. Uh, I can give you some funny examples of this, but there's a... Uh, one of the classics was uh, Marcus Jastro. I don't know if you're familiar with him. I think he died in the, uh, the, se the late 70s, early 80s. So Marcus Jetro was apparently some kind of, uh, of giant in, uh, in Talmud. He was very learned, very erudite, very quick. He was recognized by a lot of rabbis as, uh, uh, as being very promising in Talmudic uh, study. And he was offered jobs by both the conservative and the orthodox movements. A little bit of uh, competition over him. He wrote uh, a very nice and pretty academic uh, dictionary of uh, Talmudic Aramaic, uh, I believe it was Aramaic to English is how he, uh, he translated, but uh, it's a very popular uh, dictionary amongst people who learn Talmud, except in Haredi circles where they don't learn it because he had one foot in the conservative movement. So at the end of the day, he accepted a job, I don't remember if it was the Jewish Theological Seminary, Jewish Theological Cemetery, on, uh, on 100, uh, what is it, 120th Street and uh, Broadway. Uh, he had decided that he was going to take up this conservative job. I don't even remember what for. If it was whatever, money, the terms, access to a bigger, better library, maybe they had more money. So he died on a plane. He died like mid-flight, not long after he actually accepted this position, which a lot of people, at least in the Orthodox community, thought was very, uh, was very curious. Like by the time he had made this decision that he's going to go conservative, but you know he was he he left us for whatever reason. Um, Many Orthodox rabbis started working in communities that weren't very religious. We're always going to have this problem. When you're analyzing a community, if it's reform or if it's conservative, are these people actually ideologically reform or conservative? Or are they just laxed in their practice and therefore looking for some place that's a little bit less judgmental or has lower expectations of them than, uh, than let's say, orthodoxy might uh, which might put them off if they haven't had the benefit of an Orthodox Jewish education, etc. Yeah, I've seen shuls that are uh, Orthodox, or at least, let's say, respect the standard of uh, traditional Judaism. Mm. And you can see people, like, on the third wall, I see the shishit having her cell phone like that. I've seen that in Paris. Nobody judges. I, you know, the guy is, is, uh, is discreet about enough to have it under the table, and I, 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 you know, I saw it because I was next to the guy, but yeah. nobody else in the room saw it. Maybe he was a doctor, but maybe he was saving somebody's let's life. Let's put it this way, but, um, um, you know, there, the, it, you, can, you don't have to be judged. It's not because we're orthodox that we have to be judgmental. Oh, okay. We're going to get there a little bit uh, a okay, little I'm later. Okay, I'm we're gonna take a this, few steps ahead. Gonna Sorry. Take this step. No, no, it's okay. It's important. It's important. But we're going we're gonna to take this step by step. So the reform movement from its very beginnings, don't forget, 1885, you're already about, you know, more than 100 years into the reform movement. And it's a big uh, amorphous group of people who have uh, one thing in common, which is that they're looking to, to reduce uh, the restrictions placed on them by religion uh, one way or the other. And the theology started already to, to lag behind where the people were going. 
In other words, it wasn't like in Germany they decided this mitzvah counts, this one doesn't, this one's important, that one's not, this one's outdated, this one's modern, we're going to invent new mitzvot. It was always a reduction of, uh, of mitzvot. It was always, you know, just uh, ignoring them or avoiding them or reinterpreting them such that they no longer apply. Uh, and this continued, and it continued very quickly, and Quran, it was very popular with people who just weren't that religious to begin with. So if one guy's going to tell me, you should be more observant, but you're not. And other guys are going to tell me, no, no, you don't have to be that observant. Here, you're welcome and accepted. I'm going to go where I'm accepted. Why? If I have, unless I have theological uh, scruples, or at least a little bit of a background. I'll go wherever people make me happy, wherever I feel good. So 1885 was a big break. They had this convention. They were serving shellfish, and they were serving uh, shrimp and lobster. It was just a conservative. Uh, th those who later began the conservative movement walked out of there shocked. And a lot of them were still much, much closer to orthodoxy than we would uh, think. I'm just giving you an example. I knew personally, when I was in Fairlawn, New Jersey, Rabbi, uh, I could find you his name, uh, not Lopatin, Latkin, something like that. Anyway, um, he was a, a, a rabbi of a conservative synagogue that had about uh, four or five hundred uh, member families to it. He ate only kosher. He kept Shabbat. And he was very upset at his community for, you know, so many people driving to the Tzitzit on Shabbat. I'm talking to you about seven, eight years ago. I'm not talking about uh, the 1980s. Um, so he was ordained from the Jewish Theological Seminary on, here on, uh, on Broadway in, uh, I guess, about 120. Um, you know, th there were still conservative rabbis whose practice was pretty much orthodox. Uh, today that's becoming less and less the case. The wheels came off that wagon very quickly, and we pointed out that whenever there's a reform, you get the car in gear and you just it, it rolls down a hill. You can never stop it from uh, from you know, reforming other things until it's totally out of control. The way it worked with conservatism was as follows. There were a couple of key principles that they absolutely insisted upon. They said, look, there's no way you can write these things out of the Torah or out of Jewish practice. One of them, and this was a very already at this point a very strong divide between them and the reform rabbis of the time, Moses Mendelssohn had already decomposed by then, uh, we're talking about, uh, let's say, the divine origin of the Torah, for example. The reform movement did not believe, I mean, almost anyone, <laughs> no one in the reform movement believed the Torah was itself of divine origin. They had varying degrees of divine inspiration. It was divinely inspired, it was... Whatever that means, however they define prophecy, there was some kind of a divine spark in the, uh, the giving of the Torah. So they don't believe it was verbatim, for example. It wasn't the Torah, it wasn't given according to the Reform movement. It wasn't given to Moshe, word by word, letter by letter, mitzvah by mitzvah. It was concepts, it was principles, it was ideas. The Reform very much believed that all of the mitzvot needed to be uh, re-evaluated, re-examined in historical or modern context, in other words, in a time-based context, and therefore many of them no longer applied. We're going to talk about that in a second. Uh, the conservatives were slower to come to that conclusion. Eventually it came, but they came, it came much more slowly to them. For example, and the classic example will always be, unless someone wants to beat me to it. Separation of men and women? Okay. That's a, a close second, but homosexuality is the key. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, That's the same separation though. of men and women is one thing, but if Moshe Rabbeinu knew who David Bowie was, maybe he also would have accepted <laughs> homosexuality or bisexuality. Or if we believe he was a prophet, maybe he knew who David Bowie was, and that's why he said, don't do this, it's a bad idea. Um, you know, the, if back in the day that was considered an abomination, then today maybe not so much. Uh, some of them make really good fashion designers and interior decorators and artists. You know, so there are contributions they can make to society. Why should we uh, lose a whole group of people or alienate them from our uh, communities just because they, uh, they happen to, uh, to march to the uh, tune of uh, the beat of a different drum? So the conservative movement uh, did not accept that the Torah was only divinely inspired. To say that anyone who feels divinely inspired can compose whatever they wanted. By the way, just to put this out there, if you believe that the Torah was divinely inspired, but not verbatim, that means that the authority that you accord yourself in deciding which mitzvot apply and which ones don't also has to be pretty divine, no? I'm just putting that out there. The Christians were more honest than this. 
The Christians honestly believed that Jesus was divinely inspired, and therefore he had the authority to tell you which mitzvot uh, apply and which ones don't. And according to, uh, to Paul, none of them applied. There's a new deal. Some of them got re-mentioned, you know, were mentioned uh, at least another time in the, the New Testament. And therefore, according to them, Jesus had the authority to cancel the entire Torah and to give new mitzvot. But at least they believed it was divine, and they don't believe that they can add or detract any more mitzvot today. They only have like five or six, so they make that relatively easy. The Reform Movement is telling you that the Torah was kind of divinely inspired, and that Moshe sort of composed with a semi-divine spirit, however you want to define it, uh, mitzvot and avirot, positive and negative commandments, that applied to his time. Who is the divinely inspired individual who determines what applies to our time and what doesn't? Are any of the mitzvot so easy, so normal, and so natural that they, you know, should apply at all times in all places and others shouldn't? Is it easy to honor your parents in our generation or easier than it was before? I would contest that the mitzvah of kibbutz Ve'im is much harder in our times, right? In the Facebook, Twitter, Instagram era. People, I know kids who call their parents by their first name. It's, it's a humiliation, but they do it. So... Maybe this mitzvah actually becomes more important because it's that much more contrary to our natural instincts and inclinations living in a very modern era where nobody cares. I might say the same thing for homosexuality, but I'd be stoned. So maybe we have to be that much more careful about some of these transgressions today because society has changed. And then we go back to this famous Woodrow Wilson quote. I don't care much for the man as a president or as a politician. He was a very pronounced racist. But Woodrow Wilson did make the point that change is not progress. Because society has changed, the fact that society has changed implies that all these changes are good. Everything society does today, the context by which you want to judge the mitzvot, and which ones apply and which ones don't, you presume, you presume that all these changes that happened were changes for the better, and therefore we live in a more spiritual society than we used to. Because we need to make less spiritual efforts and we need to be less spiritually focused in this generation because of science and science has only been put to good and positive uses and science hasn't been abused or hijacked or taken uh, hostage by certain agendas so these are questions that obviously they never asked themselves because they didn't care for the answers so the conservative movement rejects this no the Torah was divinely inspired the term conservative it was a point made by a number of uh, conservatives let's call them leaders if not rabbis a number of the conservative leaders said the same way that the British used the term conservative in politics to mean that the law and the, uh, you know, the legal tradition are to be conserved unless or until some very compelling need comes up that calls them into question, the default position of the conservative movement is, was supposed to be we will retain all the mitzvot and all the avirot unless we feel some compelling or urgent need to address, uh, you know, in, in light of modern society, where people stand, the applicability of certain concepts, certain Torah ideas. So that's where the idea of conservative comes from. It's not conservative relative to orthodoxy. Orthodoxy is a lot more conservative than conservative is. It's that their goal was, in light of the reform movement, to conserve the mitzvot that were now being thrown out. But the conservatives aren't orthodox. The, conserv the conservatives believe the mitzvot should be observed. They did, at least originally. Uh, they do, however, believe that a certain degree of scrutiny and academic uh, study needs to be, uh, academic rigor, let's say, in their, in their terms, needs to be applied to the uh, Talmud, to the Midrashim, to the Zohar, etc. Hey, you want to study something that's nice, uh, not all of it is binding. And in fact, they're much more critical of characters in Tanakh. We spoke about rabbis, rabbinic authority, kihuna, things like this, where uh, they believe that a lot of the Agadah, a lot of the, uh, the stories told in the Talmud are either not to be taken literally or they're exaggerated or the rabbis always make the, uh, uh, the protagonist come out you know, looking good if it's, uh, if it's one of the people we refer to as a tzaddik and they have a way of, uh, of painting the Roshayim in a negative light which is, by the way, not necessarily true. You'll find many Midrashim that talk about the strong points of someone like Haman or Paro or Hashverosh they find certain points of praise where even though this person was wicked, look, they were careful to do this or careful to do that. Lavan, another example. Even though what he did was very treacherous and uh, deceitful, they, 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 we learn halakha from this. 
ideally, if you have it your way, you'd make your efforts to marry off your older daughter, your oldest son, before the second in, uh, in line. It's just a logical thing. So even Lavan, as a bigger Rosh as he was, when he tells you, we don't do like this in our, uh, in our place, but rather, I should marry off my oldest daughter before that. So you could, could have told them this ahead of time too, but, but as a halacha that we learned from someone's a rasha, that's pretty impressive. It's not like we just, uh, you know, tar and feather him and, uh, and leave him for dead. Okay, he was a big rasha, but even this we can learn from him. So that was one idea, the divine inspiration of the, uh, of the Torah, the applicability of the, Torah, of the, uh, the mitzvot and the amirot, even to the modern, modern age. With time, and this you should know, began right about 1970. It's not like the conservative movement began as the feminist or uh, you know pro-gay movement that many of us see in it today. It, it women played effectively the same role as uh, in an orthodox synagogue as they did in a conservative one. So the idea of uh, taking down the mechitza or of uh, women serving as uh, Torah readers or as uh, part of a minyan uh, was very novel to them. And in fact, it's no coincidence that it coincides with the, uh, the feminist movement. This is late 60s, early 70s, when a lot of these questions started to be, uh, to be asked. So uh, the conservatives were very quick to adopt this concept of uh, egalitarianism. It's one of the, today, one of the most fundamental principles they believe. There are, nor should there be, any differences between men and women. And so women uh, in conservative theology count for a minyan, they count as witnesses, they serve as judges, they can uh, officiate and write uh, gitin, uh, something that uh, the orthodoxy uh, doesn't really embrace. And in fact, many of the conservative communities at the time already broke with them over this. In Canada, for example, conservative tends to be more conservative because everything is slow in Canada. It's either ice or it's maple syrup. Everything moves very slowly in Canada. And, and like in caribou-drawn carts. So they, uh, they do have... Uh, La best I apologize if you're from Canada, I don't mean any offense. Yeah, yeah. No, I happen to love hockey, just the Canadians are slower. <laughs> it, is, <laughs> it is what it is. Anyway, um, but yeah, so, so the conservative movement is, is, is still to this day still more conservative than, uh, than the conservative movement in, uh, in America. Egalitarianism has become a big thing for them. Now, uh, there's a very important point to be made in all of this, and this really is a major distinction between the conservatives and the reform. Conservative uh, theology still uh, claims to base everything they do on the Talmud and on halachic precedent, which is not to say that we embrace everything that they do, but they claim to have a basis for everything they do. And I'll give you an example of this. There is a version of the Talmud that says that the brachot that we recite in the morning, you ever seen a conservative uh, siddur? Hmm? So in the, uh, in the beginning, let's say brachot shahar, like the brachot that we make in the morning, as soon as you wake up. Shkazim and Sephardim have uh, a slightly different order, but we recite all the same, uh, the same brachot, and almost uh, the same verbatim, you know, word for word. There is an opinion, a uh, girsa, uh, a version of the Talmud, that holds that uh, we say in the morning, Instead of Baruch Hashem Lekalmech Olam Shelo Asani Goy or Shelo Asani Goya, or we praise, thank God for not having made us a uh, Gentile, male or female, um, they read She Asani Israel, like we you know, praise, we're blessed, are you the Eternal One, King of the Universe, uh, who created me Jewish. In other words, not in a negative way, as if not to cast the Gentiles in a uh, negative light. How, by the way, the, the Italians? I was, I was going to tell you. That's what the Italians do also. Uh, yeah. Right, Shasani Israel. So there is such an opinion that Talmud. It could be that it was the Venetia uh, edition that favored this one version over the uh, over the others. Uh, it's funny that the Italians of all people should be <laughs> holding from this particular version, having that in common with the conservatives. But uh, well, so that's the question. That's the question. It's not so clear from many places in the Talmud if we actually changed it so as to offend the Christians less. Mm -hmm. I think in Italy they were very sensitive to this because yeah. the uh, the Vatican was still teaching Hebrew and they were still you know using the Talmud in order to attack and to try to coerce Jews into uh, into accepting Christianity. Uh, and incidentally, the early Christians, as I mentioned already a couple of weeks ago, did believe this was the natural. Uh, continuation of the Torah and prophetic uh, tradition. It wasn't like they believed they were starting a new religion. Their claim was, this is Torah, this is what the prophets were talking about and waiting for, 
and shame on you for not accepting it. This is your your job, you know. You've you've uh, basically that's what they believe. That's a very uh, the cornerstone of their theology for many years was the Jews let him down. They disappointed him. They turned him in. They turned their backs on him, and they rejected him, etc. So the conservatives will take something like that, and instead of trashing the whole, you know, or throwing the sidur in the garbage the way the, uh, the reform did, they'll say, no, we just favor the, the version that's a little bit more politically correct, the one that we like better. So, Yisrael. no offense, Manuel, you go ahead and pray to whatever God you pray to, but you <laughs> keep that version uh, if that's your tradition. Uh, then we would say, uh, or for a woman. They would read it, Shasani ben Horin. This one, no. Okay. And then uh, number three is um, we would read Shlosh Ani Isha with Shem Malchum uh, Baruch Atah Shlosh Ani Isha. The Sefaradiot read Baruch Shasani Kirtzono. Ashkenaziot would read that with Shem Malchum Baruch Atah Shem Malchum Shasani Kirtzono. Blessed is Shem Atah for having made me uh, as per his. Uh, his Why desire without the well. Shem Malchum? If it's interesting not going to monopolize the entire shul? Yeah, uh, no, no, a very interesting question. The bracha that we make, Shlach Sani Isha, there are a few explanations to this. One of them is that men have more mitzvot and more obligations. Not that we're necessarily better at meeting them, but we have yeah. uh, more, <laughs> more opportunities to, uh, to do uh, mitzvot and uh, the And uh, women are not less involved with Torah. They're very active. Motherhood, raising children, tending to a house is, uh, is very uh, preoccupying. So... Chazal said that uh, one who's preoccupied by one mitzvah is generally exempt from another. And so it seems the Torah left, uh, left space for this uh, to be a time-consuming pursuit, and, uh, and we depend on this. For a woman to say, literally is saying that Hashem made me uh, exactly as He wanted, it, it, it connotes a certain sense of perfection. This is what some of the Boskim uh, refer to when they say, look, not so easy to say such a thing with Hashem Malchut and to say I am exactly as God wants me to be. Uh, the way Hashem created me is one thing, but uh, you know we we don't. Uh, there are those who felt a certain sensitivity towards claims of perfection. I'm um, an expression of God's divine will, and this is exactly how I am. So it's a little bit. Some of them were a little bit hesitant about adding Hashem Malchut to that particular version. So. So you were saying the conservative? They would read. Oh, sorry. So they would read. Uh, they all say Baruch Hashem Oh. Yeah. Okay. No, so it's not to write. It makes sense. Connote some or imply some kind of a preference towards men. Remember they were saying? Everybody says the same thing. Um, anyhow, there's a version of the Gemara that reads like this. So, true, it hasn't been in use for, say, for the Italians in the case of Baruch uh, Hashem no offense, by the way, for maybe 1,400 years uh, until this time, maybe 1,500 years. So, to go ahead and resurrect the dead and try to bring something up out of the Talmud, even though already at that time it had been rejected by pretty much most of the rest of the nation, uh, is a little bit curious. There are many other ideas in the Talmud that aren't necessarily practiced today, but at least in their case, for better or for worse, um, they kind of insist on finding some kind of a halachic basis for what it is that they're doing. Uh, and so in the case of uh, women, for example, serving as uh, witnesses or... Uh, as a dayano, as, as judges, the Talmud doesn't really have an opinion that holds that it's uh, this way. But you have the case, for example, of um, of Devorah, Devorah Nevi'a, right? The famous Devorah, the prophetess, uh, was also she appears in the book of Shoftim, the book of Judges. So there's a discussion, there's a bit of a debate, a little bit more amongst the, the Rishonim than it is amongst the uh, in the uh, the Talmud itself as to how ideal was that situation? Is it just a function of, of the fact that she was a prophetess, that she was a very wise woman, therefore more qualified than any man in her generation to serve as the, let's say, chief uh, justice of, uh, of the Jewish court at the time? Uh, one way or the other, the generation was on a very low level. That's true of most of Sefer Shoftim. It's not very impressive. You go through Sefer Shoftim, you see where the nation is holding. We had some unique individuals, but... Um, but on the whole, it was uh, it's a sefer that's that's unfortunately a lot of episodes of idolatry and other uh, other national problems in it. So, if it's a matter of how much she studied, and how much she learned, then fine. Then she is as qualified as anyone else. If that's the case, if there's something more fundamental to it that the Torah, for whatever reason, 
you know, didn't really appoint, uh, uh, we don't have any, many other examples, many other examples of a woman who was appointed as a judge uh, in her time. So the discussion appears in the, uh, in Chosh Mishpat, in the, uh, the Shulchan Aruch, the Torah, the Beit Yosef, and, uh, and pretty traditionally we don't appoint women as judges in, uh, in Jewish courts. So they'll say, okay, there was once a case, exceptional though it was, uh, we're going to make this into a matter of policy because there is some kind of a precedent for it. Uh, we're going to, you know, take this and, um, and run with it. So you Very know, interesting how recently, yeah. You know which question I'm going to ask then? About so, the, what's it, or, uh, or the, uh, what's so if, uh, if they use women as judges, can you, I mean, the, the most critical point is probably going to be Gitin. Can you uh, trust a conservative get or not? Right. Or do you have to do an uh, it becomes Do you consider uh, then, you know, Mamzerim and all those uh, stories, you know what I'm... I once had, uh, someone showed me, uh, we were redoing a get for a guy who previously gave a conservative get. Right? But it seems pretty clear that the wedding was a wedding, that the divorce was... But that's what you said last week, it's easy to get married, it's, it's tough to get divorced. divorced. It's hard to get divorced, right. It's, it's almost supposed to be that way. Um, so someone showed me a, a get. Now, I, have you ever seen the calligraphy, the Torah script? So if you look closely at the Sefer Torah, Mr. Zayel, you'll notice that there are certain letters that we sometimes stretch a little bit in order to, to finish the line flush with the, uh, uh, the margin. Have you ever seen this? Like a big uh, tab, for example? Yes. Mr. Zot. Yeah. Uh, like the last, second to last line of Mezuzah. So it's not uncommon that there are certain letters. According to the Shulchan Aruch, this is the Sephardi tradition, uh, the, the letters that you can stretch out are the letters Leridta. Lamed, Resh, Dalit, Tau, and He. Why? Because these letters, as wide as you make them, tend not to lose their, uh, their, their identifying characteristics, their validity, uh, when they're stretched laterally. Right? So a Dalit is going to look like a Dalit no matter how long or short it is. It looks like a funny Dalit with a disproportionately small leg, but it still looks like a Dalit. The Lamed has this flag on top, so it's kind of hard to mistake for another letter. Dalit and Rish are very similar. The Tau and the hair are very similar. They stand on two legs, so... Um, you know, those are letters that we traditionally uh, stretch out. In some communities, Chet, and some others not, so we, we tend to shy away from it today. Someone showed me once a conservative get with a stretched out yod. Think about that. <laughs> what does a yod look like when you stretch it out laterally? Like a bar. I mean, it looks like a rish, is what it looks like. Yeah, it could. If you, if you go too far down. I don't, not even, I, I, I couldn't, reading the get, I couldn't find the compelling reason why this had to be the letter that the guy stretched out because he didn't know what he was doing. But. So this is why you read it, the, the get, on this specific case, or this is... It was a get that wouldn't have been accepted by any orthodox big team, put it that way. So... But are you going to... I don't get the reason, sorry. So if you take, I mean, I can no, draw this for you. No, I don't get the reason why should it be a, should it be a statue that you... Why would you stretch a yod? Yeah, well, there is no good reason to stretch a yod. You, you do it in order to offend people with orthodox proclivities. That's it. That's it. Uh, <laughs> that's it. <laughs> there, there is no good reason to ever want to do that. I mean, you're writing a, a sensitive document. You want to make sure that it's accurate. The problem with stretching a yod is that you made another letter out of it. It doesn't look like yod. It looks like a rish. You know, a child reads it as a rish. It's a rish. So, um, yeah, not a happy, uh, not a happy situation. Anyway. Um, you know, as time progresses, they incorporate more and more of this. A lot of us do with the Sidur, by the way, because don't forget the conservatives still pray. So Reform Judaism did away with the Sidur a long time ago because they don't pray anymore. I don't know if they pray to the sun, the moon, or the stars. They don't pray to anybody. They have a uh, synagogue. The prayer is kind of optional. Uh, the way the conservatives put it, um, first of all, they don't believe anymore in, uh, in sacrifices. They actually struck that from all reference in the Sidurim. They're, they only appear in the, in the past tense. So yes, they didn't erase the Torah, the Psukim in the Torah itself that describe, for example, Abraham was thankfully brought a Qurban. They do state very emphatically that no one in our generation would ever do such a thing, nor do they wish that this should be reinstated. Okay, this is already a break with Orthodox Judaism, except, except for the fact, and I don't want this to turn into an apology for conservative Judaism, except for the fact that there is such a discussion in the Gemara, where the Gemara does say, in the future, at some point, sooner or late, or today, tomorrow, a thousand years, ten thousand years from now, 
at some point the korbanot will um, will be nullified. It's batel in Hebrew, not so clear what that means. Either they'll be nullified or they'll no longer apply. Now they may no longer apply because with God's help we'll be in a situation where no one's sinning anymore, there's nothing to atone for, that'd be great. You know, uh, this is the equivalent of saying to a husband and wife, we're going to erase I'm sorry from your marital vocabulary. You know? That's not a bad idea if we both commit to working on ourselves, we think a thousand times before we speak, we're very sensitive, delicate, gentle about how we communicate with each other. It's a really bad idea if for whatever reason none of that happens, because if we do get someone upset, or you offend someone, or take them for granted, etc., say something about our mother, the word I'm sorry, you know, the phrase I'm sorry is a really important one. I mean, it's one without which there is no marriage to speak of. So do we want the, uh, the Qurbanot? Do we not want them? Is this something that we uh, look forward to uh, nullifying? Well, we understand the Qurbanot are pretty central to what we do. Our tefilot are effectively based on them, you know, the timing, etc. Um, the conservatives don't pray for the reinstitution of the Qurbanot, although, and this is already, you know, that's the border on one side, you know, the gap between us and, and them. At the same time, they do pray for the rebuilding of Beit HaMikdash, which apparently is a vegetarian institution, according to them. <laughs> uh, and they, uh, they would very much like for the nation to return to Israel, which is a, uh, a big division between them and the Reform Movement, right? We didn't have much time to talk about this last week. The Reform Movement, the traditional classical Reform Movement, that's a contradiction in terms, but the, uh, the reform movement as it was conceived and the way it developed, at least past the, uh, you know, the 19th century threshold, the reform movement uh, had dropped any and all references to a return to Zion from its liturgy and from its literature. Reformed Jews were in no way interested or required to be interested in a return to Israel. It was antithetical to the entire movement. If the purpose of the movement was to help break down some of the barriers between Jews and non-Jews, to enable them to assimilate more into secular culture, get better jobs, get uh, you know more of a secular education, uh, start to ride the scientific and philosophical wave of the, uh, the Renaissance and the Enlightenment, then... Uh, then discussing a return to Israel, so much the more so, a temple or animal sacrifices was considered for them knuckle-dragging uh, prehistory. There's no reason any normal, modern, scientifically oriented individual would want such a thing. And in fact, many modern, scientifically inclined individuals have no desire whatsoever for these things to be reinstated. Uh, yet we pray for them all the time. We pray for this three times a day. We pray for this at, uh, during Berkat Amazon. Every time we pray, we make references to Yerushalayim being rebuilt, Beit Hamikdash. Rosh Chodesh, we make extra mention of it. So it's not like we we uh, we have no references that that imply that the sacrifices may not be valid or you know may not be in place forever. But we kind of expect that that should be uh, you know in tandem with the spiritual nature of the world uh, changing a little bit. And until then, it may not make any sense. So that's that's a very big uh, gap between us and them. And they'll, they'll find themselves kind of in the middle. In other words, the reform did away with Israel, did away with uh, uh, Beit HaMikdash. Sacrifices don't even uh, you know register. They don't even appear on their radar. Uh, whereas in Orthodoxy, we pray for these things constantly, all the time. If this is what offends the reform or the conservative movement about us and how it distinguishes us from the rest of the nations of the world, so be it. We do, we do want to return to Israel, we build Beit HaMikdash. And the conservatives will tell you, fine, we're turning to Israel, yes. Beit HaMikdash, can't really ignore that. that that's pretty explicit all over the Talmud and all over the Midrashim. However, we did find a source in the Talmud that says that in the future, the Qurbanot will no longer uh, apply. And therefore, we're going to, uh, you know, to favor that opinion, even over the majority held by opinion, the traditional opinion that everyone else in the world holds by. They'll find an odd, you know, outlier of an opinion. That happens to be a pretty universally accepted concept in the Talmud, although it, it's not practical yet, so it's, there's not much written about it. Um, but they will, sure, you know, find these um, these outliers or these unique opinions, or they'll find a particular version of the Gemara that makes more sense to them, and they'll favor it because it fits in with their all, you know, prefabricated uh, theology. They already have their ideas made up. They just want to find a source for it and say this is as traditional as anything else uh, out there. So, 
that's, uh, that's that. Another little bit of a note on that. Why would such a thing be in the Gemara if we didn't hold from it? In the case of the sacrifices, so again, at some point in the future, however far past Mashiach it'll be, it seems to be this is, the, uh, this is uh, uh, one of those longer-term goals. Um, but there's a Mishnah that I quoted once, Masechet Abdul, that describes why it is that we record opinions that aren't even halachic. Why would we bring the opinion of a, uh, a Rav or a student or a uh, Tanar and a Mora who says something that wasn't accepted uh, halachically? Why do we record the entire oral tradition as a bunch of machlokot, these disputes, these arguments? And so one of the answers given is because should someone in the future come up and say, oh, I have a great idea, and if they thought of this, they would have done like me too. Uh, our answer is no, that idea was actually already considered and rejected. It was there. Someone thought of this before you, beat you to it, and the sages at their time considered it and didn't uh, adopt that opinion for whatever reason. So uh, it was actually a safeguard against this kind of practice, right? Maybe that Mishnah they didn't learn yet, but uh, but that's already been uh, been an issue for uh, for quite some time. So they do, in theory, hold from uh, kasherut. They hold that uh, you know eating kosher food, the kosher species of animals, none of that has changed according to them. They don't think that you can eat blood or chilev. I mean they. Uh, the overwhelming majority of conservative Jews who, who observe the tenets of conservative Judaism will eat kosher food and uh, seek out for it. And I know from my own personal experience on Ramanut that uh, they do uh, encourage women to use the mikveh. I don't know how many of them go, but I know that they do, in theory, encourage it anyway. Uh, conservatism kind of uh, married itself to what they call in, uh, in Israel the Masorti movement. It's not really a movement. When someone says Masorti in Hebrew, it's ironic because generally when they say Masorti, the word Masoret means tradition. Someone who tells you they're Masorti generally is someone who, as they say in Hebrew, Masorti. It's the word Masor in Hebrew is a saw. So this is, the, uh, this is someone who took a saw to the tradition. They cut off the mitzvot they didn't like and they kept the ones that they remember their grandfather observing when they came for visits. I mean, uh, there is no Masorti movement in Israel. What happened is that you had a lot of Jews who weren't exactly Orthodox or who didn't fit into, let's say, the more or less normative Orthodox standard for whatever reason. And they'll tell you, Tov, I'm not anti-religious, I might not be Orthodox, but the word that they tended to use in Hebrew was Masorti, I'm traditional, like kosher style. So I do a somewhat traditional Pesach Seder, uh, you know, Rosh Hashanah, we have some of the traditional Simanim. I might drive to the beach afterwards, but it's not to say that I ignore the tradition completely. Ironically, nobody who's Orthodox refers to themselves as, you know, traditional. It is traditional Judaism, but what happens in these traditionalist movements is that they don't really educate very much. A lot of this is done kind of by rote, where they just copy certain things that they believe they know or they understand. Uh, but there's not much of a, of a conscious movement to it. The conservative movement hijacked that idea. The conservatives in Israel were basically trying to sell to market themselves to people who didn't observe that many mitzvot anyway. And they figured, we can embrace these people. We can pick them up instead of orthodoxy throwing them out. Maybe we can, uh, we can adopt them, or they can adopt us as a movement. So very, very few people are actually drawn to it. It's not a very popular movement in Israel. Uh, but they are trying to make a name for themselves in... in uh, perverting the meaning of the word Masorti to mean conservative, as if the people who don't keep that many mitzvot clearly believe the same way we do about the mitzvot that we keep, or about the way that, in which we, uh, we keep our mitzvot. So, a bit of a misnomer, but they do very publicly identify themselves that way. In Hebrew, nobody uses conservativity, they prefer Masorti because they know that Orthodox Jews are somewhat allergic to this concept of, of uh, conservative. Some very big splits occurred in the uh, in the conservative movement. This was already in the 1980s. There were some reiterations about this in the uh, the in 2006 was probably one of the biggest splits, where in the 1980s they began to ordain uh, women rabbis. Fine. Technically, the reason that we don't ordain women rabbis in, in orthodoxy is you know, has to do with traditional expectations and traditional gender roles, which say what you will. And, traditional societies, women got married, raised children, and, uh, and positions of Rabbanot weren't exactly up there. The idea of a woman pursuing a career ideally in antiquity wasn't really uh, a very widely held value. So we do have reference in the Talmud to uh, what they would call today Bodkot or Yoatot Halacha. That actually has a Talmudic precedent to it, to women being you know, specialists in certain halachic areas and actually uh, being entrusted with them. So 
you know, that I don't personally find offensive. I think it's nice actually to get people involved wherever possible. Um, the question came up though when it comes to Jewish identity and uh, interfaith marriage was really one of the biggest uh, problems they had. This is in the early 1980s. Mid-1980s they already had some kind of a symposium, whatever it was. Um, officially the conservative movement recommends, advises, that Jews marry Jews and that, uh, that's the tradition that they'd like to, uh, to upkeep. They started chipping away at some of the expectations of their clergy, where they basically said, so if there's an interfaith marriage, uh, we shouldn't officiate the wedding, whether or not a uh, conservative rabbi is allowed to be present, you know, to attend. Traditionally not, but uh, they began to look at it differently. And they published a paper about this, I think, in the 90s, saying how in antiquity, a Jew marrying an un-Jew was considered uh, an affront it was an act of, uh, of aggression against the religion, against the tradition, which is why it was so um, adamantly rejected. In our generation, where people are brought up without that kind of uh, notion, you know, without these values being taught to them, etc., uh, it's not so much uh, an active insult to the religion as it is people who just aren't that very initiated and aren't very uh, erudite, you know, they're not very well read, they just, whatever, met a nice guy, met a nice girl want to get married. So it began to be less taboo to, uh, to attend such, a, such an event. The rabbis still weren't supposed to officiate it. Later, already in the 21st century, they started officiating, uh, you know, or, or at least attending passively, however you want to read that. Gay marriage became another question because, of course, it's the defining issue of our generation. But what if they're really nice guys? <laughs> like, why should we be opposed to this? Uh, so there's no utilitarian reason for which people should be opposed to homosexuality. It doesn't bother you, it doesn't infringe on your rights. Why should you care? You can take the libertarian approach. But really, as a religion, we're, uh, we're still a little bit bothered by it. So uh, same-sex marriage within, you know, as in like Jewish guy plus Jewish guy, uh, was traditionally rejected. I think in the 80s they began to rethink it a little bit. Uh, and at this point, I think they have a, uh, some form of uh, commitment ceremony, not quite marriage, but commitment ceremony. And somewhere in the fine print, they still maintain the traditional biblical interdiction on men engaging in anal sex. So like, at least there's a disclaimer somewhere that you know, men aren't supposed to uh, engage in sexual activities described by the Torah as abominable. Uh, they might throw a party and have a, a commitment ceremony, but they would expect that the men... Uh, abide by, by that one in particular. Uh, now again, because that's biblically forbidden, it's funny this comes up because we just had that whole series on homosexuality, uh, it seems like they aren't that offended by uh, lesbian marriage. At least that they don't have too many caveats that's and exceptions. That, that was the question you were going to ask out of the fashion corner. So, uh, yeah. There are no lesbians in fashion. There are no lesbians in fashion. They don't dress well enough to... Uh, so you're basically discriminatory is what you're saying. <laughs> it's been discriminated against against so, straight people and uh, flannel shirts straight, and jeans straight, went out of style in the 70s. And, uh, <laughs> and, uh, and gay, gay. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, actually, I actually wanted to ask you about the um, uh, woman being a rabbi. So the issue that the most has with that yeah. is because it's a profession. So the same way they would be against that would be I against. I think it's a profession. The, um, Rabbi Schwartz spoke about this. We, we, we were always on... Uh, I was there, I remember. On Shavuot. Yeah. So, the Raman uh, makes a statement about this. And it's not a statement that has clear roots on the Quran. I was listening only to your Rabbi that day. At that particular point. Right. Right. Oh, it's funny. When someone asked the question about it, about the ordination of women, and all the rabbis on this panel all of a sudden became really quiet, and I said, okay, so Rabbi Schwartz is sure. No, he's got to deal with this. So <laughs> None of us were going to jump in and say anything right. that was going to get him in trouble with his own congregation. Right. So, uh, so he said that uh, traditionally orthodoxy has followed this uh, ruling of the Rambam, where it's 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 a funny topic, by the way. But you know, the, the ruling of the Rambam is that uh, he holds that women should not be appointed for uh, for public office. Doesn't sound like just the Rabbanut, meaning to him the idea of having a female president of a country or like a woman general in the army, something offensive that it violated this uh, expectation that. Uh, you know, that there's some kind of a, of a lack of uh, tzniut, not in the physical sexual sense, and the, the idea that this is, it was not a societal expectation of women, it was considered uh, 
you could go so far as to say somewhat offensive or, or um, abnormal in the eyes of society at the time. So how much of this still uh, registers today is a very, very interesting question. I think if you ask me personally, the boundary is starting to melt anyway, uh, where you have women teaching, you have women professors, you have um, elected officials, you know, to all forms of uh, governments. Young Israel, of, uh, the, the movement, women playing soccer. There's a woman who broke her back, uh, she had a spinal injury, played hockey the other day. Yeah, um, so you had, uh, the, the, for example, the, the Young Israel movement, which is kind of straddling the fence between modern orthodoxy and Haredi, Lithuanian. Uh, it's hard to say. I don't know what Young Israel of Los Angeles is like. Everything in Los Angeles is different. I mean, it's not even worth it. Don't even start. But Young Israel in, in, here in the Northeast is considered still very, it's about as far right as, as, as let's say, orthodoxy, modern orthodoxy gets before you really end up in Haredi territory. And they have in their charter, well, they have two interesting things in their charter. One of them is that no rabbi who ever served in a conservative synagogue is allowed to serve as the rabbi of a young Israel community. Even if he does Shuba. Yeah, even if he does the Shuba. Why? Yes. Because when the conservative movement started, clearly they didn't have schools of their own or yeshivas of their own. And the only rabbis that were available to them, if they wanted to be a real community with a rabbi so they could have fights, they decided that they were uh, going to have to hire rabbis from traditional Orthodox yeshivas, most of which were in Europe because at the time they were, you know, Learned people were coming from Europe and becoming Amehalats here in America before they established yeshivot over here. So many rabbis who couldn't find a job went to a conservative synagogue because they needed a way to make a living. And a lot of the rabbis you know, in the Orthodox movement saw that as an insult because they were basically selling out on, their, uh, on, the, on the tradition in order to make themselves a paranasa. So they didn't want... That wasn't meant to slam the door in the face of those who were doing Teshuvah. It was meant to slam the door in the face of those who were thinking of doing it in the first place. Meaning, you may not have found a job in an Orthodox community. You're not going to go find a job in a conservative synagogue in order to beef up your resume and then try to find a job over here. That's not going to happen. But that was one of the things they put their foot down about. The other is that women can serve on the board of the synagogue, but they shouldn't be present. In deference to the Rambam and this you know, traditional understanding of women's roles in society, uh, which I, I don't necessarily you know hold from. I think that there's uh, not that who am I to con contradict the Rambam. Just I think that, uh, and this is where I'm going with this discussion. I mean, there are things about orthodoxy that that can change, and that probably eventually will. Uh, just taking an axe to the tradition always resulted in these very bizarre, semi-idolatrous or totally heretical forms of apostasy. I mean, there's, there's so much good that gets thrown out with what they perceive as, you know, wrong or outdated or, uh, or antiquated. So, even young Israel, what's the irony? As you would say, oh, no, a woman can do anything but be the president of young Israel. The fact that young Israel has women serving on the board is already um, different. It's a break with tradition, because in Europe you would never have had such a thing. No one in Europe would ever have had a, a board of directors of a synagogue that had a woman on it, let alone more than one. So here you can have ten women sitting on a board and one man as the president, and he'd be outvoted every time he ever voted anything up. But and I hope for his sake that he dresses well. <laughs> <laughs> but at the end of the day, this this is it's ironic in in a sense because they're basically admitting to you, yes, we know that women are taking positions of prominence. In fact, we know that women have better ideas and show up on time, and they're much more organized than the men on our boards. And so they realized that they couldn't say women shouldn't serve on the board, even though it's a position of prominence, because obviously you're a board member, you have a position of more importance than the rest of the, the members of the community. Uh, and so they won't, they won't reject that idea that the women have so much to contribute to the, to the, to the board, just they, you know, the president specifically shouldn't be a woman. That's like they're, what they reserved uh, in deference to the, uh, to the Rambam. So, you know, in the long and short of it, there are... Uh, certain ideas that are starting to uh, to trickle either way. Right now in Israel, there's a big uh, to do, and I love Israel for this because the scandals are sometimes so silly. It's funny that like, people are still fighting about this, but it's cute. The the concept of a yoetzet or a bodechet. So this is really kind of unique to Tarat Hamishpacha, but the idea that women can make rulings on these things without having to go necessarily to uh, to a prominent rabbi or to a local Orthodox rabbi to get a ruling on it. That already appears in the Talmud. 
this really is in the Gemara. Like, I'm not conservative. I'm not conservative with a capital C. Uh, if I tell you that, uh, that that there's already a Talmudic precedent for, and there's no reason why women couldn't do this, in fact, the more comfortable we can make women with Tarot uh, HaMishpacha, That's what I was gonna the say. more women are going to it's... observe the mitzvot. Like, why would we not do this? If already it would be without a C, I think he was pretty firm. In his neighborhood, there was an, uh, an elderly woman who would, you know, teach women these halachot and encourage them to observe them. Why would we not do this? Why would we not take advantage of something that already has a halachic precedent to, to it? There's no dispute about it. It's not like it's a rare, unique, one-off kind of opinion. Could be. He was living in a big city where you had, you know, thank God, a little bit more by way of education for women. Speaking of which, is it a bad thing that women today learn how to read and write? And, you know, the options, the... the, the uh, Basic, at least basic knowledge of science, of uh, economics. I mean, some of these things are pretty crucial to raising a normal family and being able to support it. So, obviously, we uh, we support a lot of these uh, these. Uh, this I'll call in advance. I think it's great. We would have access to education. Uh, where or at what point do you draw the um, ideological line and say this is already too much, or what we're doing is actually not advancing the cause of women, but retarding the advancement of society by telling women they have to do what men do in order to be uh, respected and appreciated. So a woman without a degree is considered less than a woman because she didn't, she didn't go to college or not. These are answers, uh, questions that every society is going to have to answer for itself. But um, I'll still, I'll still uh, side with the change is not progress approach. Just because things are different today doesn't mean by definition better or worse. We just need to sort of analyze these things one by one and make sure that if we are incorporating some kind of a change or some kind of break from society, at least that it's you know, uh, a net gain and that we're not damaging anything uh, especially important uh, to begin with. But those are discussions that we'll have to, uh, to continue to have. So if I had to make a prediction, at least in terms of the conservative movement, they've already embraced uh, openly gay members of clergy, as long as they're not men actively engaged in anal sex, which is great. Uh, they've uh, already got their commitment ceremonies for same-sex marriages, um, and they've pretty much uh, done away with the uh, obstacles to intermarriage. My humble prediction is that most of the conservative movement is going to go off the reform cliff in another generation or two. If history has taught us anything, that's where we should expect it to go. I didn't talk about reconstructionism. We can do that next week. It's a whole other category. Uh, but and what about the idea that once they started uh, reforming things, conservatism lags behind reform Judaism by anywhere between 50 and 100 years on any given issue. So whether or not they expect their congregants to keep kosher, at least most conservative synagogues do have a kosher policy in place. What they consider kosher and what they'll bring in and what they won't is probably going to change with time. You're going to have less and less people who are devoted to keeping the moment exactly the way it is. Those who are more insistent about it are just going to tend right and end up in open orthodoxy or orthodoxy altogether. And those who uh, tend left are basically either going to pull the official policies down or they'll dilute the pool of people who observe these uh, halachot to effective nothingness. Like you'll have one or two families per synagogue that observe these mitzvot. The rest of them don't care. They come on and they do whatever they do. So, uh, don't expect any of the reforming to stop anywhere near where it is right now. They're just a hop, skip, and a jump away from openly embracing homosexuality in all of its forms. Eventually, intermarriage is going to come too. So, Rabbi, do you think that, uh, would you say that modern orthodoxy is similarly behind conservatism as conservatism is behind uh, reform? See, in the areas where I think uh, change is a little bit well due, if not overdue, in the orthodox well community, huh? well due. If it's it's either due or overdue, at least in certain areas, in my opinion, okay. and I'm entitled to one. Um, I think there are certain things that are going to change. I've gotten a little bit less aggressive about insisting that the change come at you know, a faster clip than it currently does because the speed at which things change tends to increase over time. So if you start with small reforms, they get bigger. Once you reform this, you can reform that. And then just you're in sixth gear by the time you know it. And, and the car is totally out of control. So, you know, that things change slowly in orthodoxy, if it's any uh, encouragement to you, I believe they're changing, uh, first of all, a lot faster than they used to. Don't forget, this is a movement, I mean, how many orthodox homes today do you know that don't have internet? Even in Haredi circles, I mean... Well, it's a war tool, and not everybody's a rabbi. 
but it's become so difficult to exclude it because there's some, there was a whole situation, I don't want to get into this, but in, uh, in Lakewood a number of years ago, there was a problem, whatever, there was a marriage that was pretty much ruined because of husband's uh, obsessions and addictions to the industry of Tzniot. So, so they came out with this fatwa, right? That's what they call it, Yiddish, it's a fatwa. And they said, no one who has any uh, form of internet in their household uh, is allowed to send their children to any of the Talmud Torah in Lakewood, right? I should have said some random, unnamed, ultra-Orthodox uncle, but I said Lakewood. So, like, your kids were automatically deregistered from the schools in light of this scandal. It was, like... Because one guy was a moron. That was one student, and his wife happened to be, like, from a family of a certain type of country. So... He did something, they both did something crazy, and then they had to get divorced. And then uh, the school decided, like all the rabbis together decided that this was just because of the, the evil that is the internet. And so they said, that's it. All the kids are your from all schools, so you can prove to us that you don't have internet at your house. We're not letting the kids back in. And then it became, so you can prove that you only use the internet for work. You know, like, they can't. What are you going to do if you have a business, you sell things, you have a website? I mean, how do you... Well, in, internet, in, uh, in Israel, we still have those uh, periphone kasher. Right. Like so, it's, uh, you know, those uh, clam clamshell phones that don't have internet. Oh, yeah, the flip phones. Yeah, and they, they don't have, they don't even have we, we text messages. Like that for a <laughs> my, one, my wife is trying to text her uh, funny, we call best it friend the, the there. Phone, yeah. No way to, uh, yeah. yeah, that's what it is. We still have to push three buttons in order to get C and uh, F. And yeah, that's stuff. I've been, uh, I have, like, this guy that I communicate with in Israel, and it's all okay mail. That's his email address. I don't think he has any other... It's a scan for like yeah, images, right, exactly. you know, inappropriately dressed women, etc. So look, again, not to say that everything on the internet is great. Obviously, the internet is full of all kinds of you know stupidity. I mean, uh, it is what it is. Uh, as many stupid people as there are out there, I think a disproportionate number of them like to post things on the internet. But there are plenty of uh, of good uses for it too. So either we just uh, try to throw the whole thing away, baby with the bathwater. Uh, or we say, look, at least there are certain productive uses for it. Definitely not the place to spend a number of hours a day, unless this is literally what you do for a living, like you trade stocks, you, uh, you follow the news, or you write, etc. So that it took time for orthodoxy to uh, you know, embrace at least the good parts of the Internet isn't necessarily a bad thing. You understand? It's what prevents the society from falling apart altogether or from just reforming itself out of existence. Change comes slowly, but ultimately it comes. Let me ask you a question. Today, for example, do you know of any Orthodox or ultra-Orthodox communities that hold that women should not go to school until the end of high school? I'm talking 18. Should when, not go they should not go. Have you heard of any Jewish community? Told us out on the Satmar, you know... Syrians. Huh? Syrians. That's different. It's because they get married when they're 14. It's not the same thing. Hmm? <laughs> they used to. Uh, no, even in little Syria, they send the girls to school until they get married, which is like 18 years old. But they still so they're making it and cooking. Right, so they're the home ec. I mean, but even there, it's that, that's, that's some of these girls starting to go to college now. So, right, change didn't come very quickly to Syria. It came out, but after the Jews left. So, <laughs> so there are no Jewish communities around today. None. Not the Timanim, not the uh, Ashkenazim, not the Haredim, the Vitaim, mean, nobody, who believes that Jewish girls shouldn't go to school to the age of 18. Do you realize that 100 years ago, the large majority of Jewish communities in Europe were opposed to this? There were people who thought that sending the